Um, and uh, pleasure to have uh, Dr. Bradley Marsh, uh, who studied here for his doctorate and has since 2016 held a uh, British Academy postdoctoral fellowship in the faculty. And he'll be talking uh, with Professor Stefano Zacchetti. Stefano. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Um, well, I think it was really, maybe by chance, I don't know where we were selected on which procedure, but I really. Um, um, when I started to look into the, the things that, that Bradley, is, Bradley is doing, I found many resonances, very interesting resonances with things I'm doing. I work on Buddhist studies, so it's a Chinese Buddhist text, so in a completely unrelated area, but I noticed some interesting similarities. So you are, you've been working on this um, biblical revision, as you call, produced by um, a Syriac Bishop Jacob of uh, Edessa, um, in sometimes in the seventh century, as I understand it. Can you tell us a bit more about what what this revision is? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, just want to uh, say before I give my short spiel, uh, thank you all for coming. <laughs> um, <clears throat> And uh, I wanted to give a kind of brief overview of uh, Jacob and his uh, biblical revision um, because it's very much unknown even to biblical scholars, um, very much so, um, <clears throat> for, for about 10 minutes or so after which I will okay, use on some of the methodological issues that I've run into in working on this version. Uh, so Jacob of uh, Edessa, the Syriac Orthodox Bishop, was born sometime around 630 CE. Um, uh, he was educated at the famous monastic school at Keneshre, where he specialized in uh, biblical studies in the Church Fathers, and in particular uh, Greek scholarship, be it uh, philosophical or natural sciences, that sort of thing. Um, he had a very uh, robust education there. And um, if I'm honest, the, uh, the later biographers kind of describe his ecclesiastical career as being problematic. <laughs> and so uh, <laughs> I won't go over all of that, but eventually, towards the end of his life, uh, he retired to the great monastery at Tel Adda, which is about 30 miles west of Aleppo. And it was there where uh, the biographers say that he engaged in his most ambitious um, academic project, which was a full-scale revision of the Old Testament. Um, so just a slight uh, brief overview of his academic output in addition to this. Um, he really was a true polymath. Um, he, uh, through the medium of Greek scholarship, he engaged in any number of projects, both uh, translations or revisions of earlier translations into Syriac and it's thought that he exclusively wrote in Syriac. Um, if you look at his correspondence, his collected correspondence, you can see that he was kind of a go-to guy in his uh, religious community. Um, his letters reflect any number of interests from chronological to the sciences to medical things, um, philosophy, exegesis, of course and uh, even practical matters, in particular canon, things related to canon law. And he's actually one of the earliest uh, sources for um, early Islam. Right? So he, he comes up in Robert Hoyland's book. <coughs> so um, as you can see, he had a very robust educational background, particularly in Greek. And he famously uh, revised an earlier translation of Severus of Antioch's Greek hymns and homilies, which he's known for. Um, as for his biblical revision, um, unfortunately, there is no firsthand account of how, why, or through what means he revised the biblical text. Um, essentially, when you look at the text itself, it's basically an admixture of the Peshitta, which is the traditional Syriac Bible that was translated from the Hebrew, for the most part, it depends on the book, um, and also the much older Greek translation, Septuagint. 
And uh, the colophones to his version reflect this. So for instance, for his book of Daniel, the colophone states, uh, now this book of Daniel was amended using two traditions. Uh, on the one hand, it was using the Peshitta, the Bible of the Syrians, and uh, also the Bible of the Greeks. And this was done by Pius Jacob of Edessa in the year 704, 705. Um, in the great monastery of Telada. And all of these colophones, they basically say the same thing. And they were not, they're not the first person colophone of Jacob. So um, unfortunately, this is not an enormous amount of information. Um, upon reading his version and being familiar with both of these textual traditions, the book is, uh, his, his, uh, his revision is very aggregate. And he seems to basically kind of combine these sources in a very unsystematic way. Um, there's a kind of uh, mishmash, to use an academic term, um, and he kind of shuffles them around uh, using cherry picking things from one source to another. Um, as I said, uh, his edition is more or less based on the Peshitta for the most part, and he does mixing with the, uh, which, with the Greek sources, and this includes the uh, much more famous Sarah Huxpla which is a product of a much, uh, of an earlier period, um, which translated the critical texts that the Caesarean critics, um, who were, so Eusebius, Caesarea, and Pamphilus specifically, um, in, com in showing where the Greek and Hebrew disagreed, in Greek using crit the critical Aristotle and Marx. Um, now, I would further describe Jacob's version as not being preservationist. His goal was not to include each and every reading that were found in his sources. He seems to more or less give what I would describe as a guided tour. And I caution everybody in my use of the phrase guided tour because uh, this is my current hypothesis on what the how one ought to best describe the character of Jacob's mm -hmm. version. Um, it could change <laughs> as I work more on the version. Um, so for instance, just a couple of examples of uh, the decisions that he made. Um, so for instance, in his uh, revision of the books of Samuel, uh, when it comes to the part of the famous story of David and Goliath, uh, when, when he's describing Goliath's height, he actually adopts the reading from the Septuagint, which is four cubits and a span. <laughs> This is the, uh, the shorter height of Goliath, <laughs> as opposed to the Peshitta, which is six cubits and a span, which is following the traditional Hebrew text. Now, I have no idea why Jacob, when having these two readings, would select the shorter height for Goliath, because it just seems less dramatic, yeah. right? You know? um, he does not explain this reading, nor does he provide the other reading in the margin which he does from time to time. However, in a very different place of his revision in the book of Deuteronomy, in chapter 27, uh, when it comes to the part where the, uh, the Israelites are given instructions by Moses, when you guys come into the promised land, you're, they're supposed to have this covenant ceremony. And half of the tribes are to stand on Mount Ebal, and the other half are supposed to stand on Mount Gerizim, and they pronounce the cursings on Ebal and the blessings on Gerizim. Well, in, uh, in the verse that describes where the altar is supposed to be built, the traditional Hebrew text, along with the Peshitta, reads that the altar is to be on Ebal, not Gerizim, where the blessings are. Well, uh, when you read Jacob's version, he actually adopted Gerizim. Now, this is interesting because this is a reading that he specifically states in a marginal scholion has been taken from the Samaritan Pentateuch, which he had access to via the readings that were collated by the earlier Caesarean critics in the margins of the Sarah Hexpla. And he goes on to talk about how, well, it's in the Samaritan Hebrew, and it makes more sense, because why would you build an altar on the Cursings Mountain, right? That, that was his logic. Not everybody agreed with this logic. Um, but this is very rare, very rare. Jacob uh, almost never explains why he adopts one reading over the other. And there are times uh, when he 
lists one reading in his running text and puts another one in the margin without further comment, even though both of these readings are irreconcilable. <clears throat> now, when you take the, uh, the results of this version and you compare it to the test later testimonia on his views of the origins of the Peshitta, this is quite striking. According to later testimonia, Jacob reportedly believed that the Peshitta was the result of basically the apostolic mission to Edessa. So the famous story is that uh, King Abgar the V, the Black, as he was surnamed, um, he was very ill and he was a contemporary of Jesus and so he heard about Jesus and his healing powers. He writes a letter to Jesus and Jesus responds and says, listen, I'm busy. <laughs> I can't make it to Edessa right now. Um, but after I'm done here, I will send one of my apostles to you. He will heal you and, you know, establish the faith in the region. So according to the story, um, after the ascension, um, uh, Thomas sends a die, one of the 70 reportedly, uh, to Edessa where the Abgar is healed and then the community becomes Christian, obviously, as a result. Um, and both Adai and King Abgar send men to Jerusalem, and it is under the auspices of the apostles that the Bible is translated from the original tongues to Syriac. So the question I would ask myself is, is that if Jacob believed this, and I don't think there's any reason necessarily to deny that, what, why, why, would he, why would he change it? <laughs> you know, and this, this, this becomes a really serious yeah. methodological issue for yeah. me that I will, I will get into momentarily. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so uh, a little more specifics about his book of Daniel. So um, the book of Daniel, which has been in Paris um, since the time of the Sun King, <laughs> um, it's never been published. And uh, it's very rarely been mentioned, even in, in even in really old studies. At both on, on both the textual and literary level, um, his book of Daniel is actually the most interesting, uh, in my opinion, anyway, uh, the most interesting um, piece of his revised Bible. This is because he doesn't just use the Peshitta and he doesn't just use the Septuagint, because uh, in, uh, in the Greek version of Daniel, there's actually two and they disagree wildly depending on the specific chapter or story under, in question. So you have the older Septuagint translation and then you have something that's uh, attributed to Theodotion, which scholars believe was translated around about the turn of the era. And uh, for some chapters, namely chapter four, five, and six, so that's Nebuchadnezzar's tree dream, Belshazzar's feast with the famous writing on the wall, and also uh, Daniel and the Lion's Den. These three chapters in particular are very different. Scholars disagree on this. Uh, there's been a recent flare up actually in disagreement, but traditionally scholars have felt that the Old Greek was based on a different Semitic source text for that section of the book. <clears throat> so, um, but it's very clear based upon my preliminary collations of uh, Jacob's work that he wasn't just uh, using Theodosian or just using the Septuagint, he was actually using both. Um, so uh, just if we could pass this around, this is my uh, provisional translation of the first chapter and this is just my English translation. This is just to show you just how much Jacob edited the Peshitta, uh, but everything in bold He's changed, and anything in bold underline is specifically Old Greek. So if you could just pass that around. Okay. So as yeah. you can see, he's, his, his editorial practice is very intrusive. There are two things I want to point out about his book of Daniel very quickly. Um, and then I'll end with a couple of methodological questions that I'm still struggling with in my research. Um, one of the most remarkable things about Jacob's book of Daniel is that the entire book is out of order. So traditionally, if you go to an English Bible, which is based on the traditional Hebrew Aramaic text, 
the book of Daniel is more or less divided into two parts. The first part are all the stories, and the second part are all the visions and dreams. Um, however, there is one, uh, the, the oldest old Greek witness actually has these chapters rearranged. So instead of being thematically arranged, they're chronologically rearranged based upon who was king during the, the, the specific story in question. So this uh, famous papyrus, it's numbered 967, orders the chapters as follows. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 7, 8, 5, 6, 9, 10, 11, 12, and then the additional, the so-called additions to Daniel, namely Bell and the Dragon, and lastly Susanna. Now, Jacob actually reflects this order with the sole exception that chapter 9 has been moved after Bell and the Dragon and before Susanna. Um, also, chapter 9 is not attributed to being during the time of Darius the Mede, but Darius the Persian, specifically the fourth, the fourth ruler of the Persian <coughs> Empire. Um, I argue in an article that hopefully we'll see the light of day soon, um, that actually Jacob's uh, actually reflecting a lost old Greek source here. He hasn't moved it by himself. That's not something he would do. Um, it would be utterly exceptional. Uh, another thing that's worth pointing out is that uh, traditionally, the four beasts that rise out of the sea in chapter seven in this famous vision with all the different beasts that are supposed to represent empires. Traditionally, and this is ubiquitous in Peshitta manuscripts, these empires are labeled. And they're labeled as the Babylonians, the Medes, the Persians, and the Greeks. And this is exceptionally the correct interpretation according to modern scholarship. And this interpretation, its oldest witness is dated to 532. So it's very, very old. And there's no way Jacob would not have known about this. However, when we come to his chapter seven, he labels these very differently. He follows a different model, which was much more common in first events in Josephus and fourth Ezra, which was, trans which was written around the first century. He orders them as Chaldeans, Persians, Greeks, and Romans. And he specifically labels the little horn not as Antiochus Epiphanes, but as the Antichrist. This is a significant departure from his own exegetical tradition, and I'm not entirely clear on why he's done this. One thing that's worth pointing out, however, is that round about Jacob's time period, there were some, though not all, who wanted to incorporate the rise of Islam into this, fourth, this four kingdom schema. So this is found in the Gospel of the Twelve Apostles, and also in the Armenian history that was written by Bishop uh, Sebeos. And of course, as has been famously talked about in recent scholarship, uh, one of the earliest reactions to Islam was the creation of apocalyptic texts, specifically things like uh, the apocalypse of Pseudo-Methodius. And all of these things would have been kind of, Jacob would have been aware of these, these writings. So the question is, if he has changed this kingdom schema, is he reacting to something that's going on in his own community? Or is he, is he in conversation with ideas that were kind of floating around amongst Christ, different Christian circles? And that's a question I can't, I can't answer, I don't know. Part of me says that Jacob was just being a traditionalist and he was uh, adopting a different model because uh, the, the kingdom schema that he has is as old as Hippolytus. So I don't know. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. Uh, I, I would ask three, three questions before, I, when I close here. Um, and these relate to his sources and his method and his purpose in his biblical revision. Um, with respect to his sources, if he was looking to revise the text of the Old Testament and he was aware it was translated from Hebrew, why did he not just learn Hebrew? 
Why would you use two disparate translations that often disagree for various textual reasons that he probably was unaware of? Why did he not just try to learn Hebrew? Now, you might say, well, you know, Christian Hebraism before the Renaissance was exceptional. Well, I would say, well, Jacob was exceptional, and there are examples of people who, who have done this. You know, in the Latin West, in this same exact period, Theodolf was doing the exact same thing with the Vulgate, you know, moving it closer to the Hebrew source text than even Jerome. The second question I would ask is, comes up in terms of his method, and that is, why didn't he label his sources? He very, very rarely ever discusses an individual reading in connection with his sources. And this is something that truly bothers me because when he revised that earlier translation of Severus of Antioch's hymns, he goes out of his way to do exactly that. He uses uh, color coding, different colors, ink, different colors of inks, and he uses different size script to differentiate his revision work from the earlier reviser. So he could do this, but he purposefully does not do it. My, my question is why? And then my last question, um, and then I'm done, is uh, why do this at all? You know, uh, presumably, he saw this as a kind of magnum opus of his own career, right? He's in retirement at the, at the Great Monastery. He's producing this huge, you know, volume upon volume of revisions of the Old Testament. So why do this? What was the point? And I don't know. <laughs> and the very few scholars that have bothered to work on Jacob's biblical revision don't agree either. Uh, like they, some like, so Alison Salveson is here. And uh, she has recently posited that uh, it was primarily pedagogical, that it was, it was meant to be a teaching document, which I, I, I agree with, mostly, <laughs> to be careful. <laughs> um, in response to that sort of proposal, my question would be, well, if it, was, if it was meant to teach, why didn't he label the sources? You know, um, it would be like writing a book without footnotes. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> well, you already ruled out the number of questions I could have asked. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. I, yeah, thank I, I you. use... Uh, Thank you. Now, thank you, Bradley. It's extremely interesting. As I said, this is, a, I find, um, a very um, uh, close area. And in many ways, I am happy to see that some of the problems that you are struggling with are also my own. I think there is one question, I mean, trying to look at all these from a fairly general point of view that might be of interest to also other people in the, in the, is that, in my experience, altering the letter of a broadly you know, authoritative sacred text, and the Peshitta would have been, I guess, at the time, this is always something that makes religious establishment quite nervous. And, uh, and sometimes it's actually you know, something that people don't do at all. And, uh, and, and so this really, um, yes, I mean, it's again one question. Why, why, would, you know, why would you do this? And, but also, since you said already that we, you know, we, it's, it's very hard to, uh, to answer that question, what can we learn about these or how the text was received from the history of the text itself? Because I understand that we have, as you said, very few direct sources, but from the transmission, the fortune of the text, of, of Jacob's. Uh, of Jacob's, after oh. that. What can we learn about whether this really was something that was, you know, created scandal or was affected um, or...? It's a good, it's a good question. Um, Jacob's version, I think it would be fair to say that it didn't really catch on. Uh -huh. um, we have very few examples of it. To my knowledge, it has basically no influence on the remainder of the biblical manuscript trans mm -hmm. uh, transmission in, in Syriac. Um, we have very few exemplars. Um, we have individual manuscripts, mostly partial, uh, though Daniel has been, has, has been remarkably well preserved, mm -hmm. it's, it's whole. Mm -hmm. um, but they, these copies were produced pretty soon after his, his 
uh, his, the period of his life. And um, they seem to be the only, the only actual examples of it. So, it, you know, it, it failed to make any kind of mark. Mm -hmm. But was, did it receive any attack on the other hand? There was criticism for his way of handling sacred texts or...? I honestly don't know. Um, there doesn't seem to be any evidence that people openly criticized it. Um, so for example, the, the copy uh, of Daniel that we have that was written in 720, mm -hmm. so that's 15 years after mm -hmm. the original. Um, it does have lectionary markings in the margins, so people were using it, mm -hmm. at least somebody was. Um, but it seems to have basically no currency okay. in the wider... The, the chronographers will talk about it as they go through their parade of Syriac scholarship. They will mention that Jacob did this. Um, but no further comment. Because one, one possible... Um, and then I think we should open probably the full, for the few time that remains. But one possible use uh, for a work of this kind, I mean, trying to think of a possible agenda, would, uh, I mean, ruling out any political reason for attacking an established which I, I don't know. But of course, could be as a sort of... Um, um, you know, a repository of alternative readings to be used for commentarial literature. This is something for which we have examples, like in my own field, of the use of different translations, in this case, like Indian Buddhist texts available in Chinese, used synoptically as tools to get, you know, a better sense of what the original text may yeah. have been saying. So I wonder, especially because you mentioned that one of, in one case, he justifies one of his alternative, I mean, the changes in, on the basis of a greater, let's say, exegetical possibility or something like yeah. that. Um, yeah, I, I, I truly don't see much evidence, or have found basically no evidence of <coughs> his version or even the, the scolia that mm -hmm. has yeah. been transmitted with it. Some of it ends up in other collections, but nothing that's necessarily uh, an indicator that the version itself was used. In that way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it, seem, it seems to have gone over like a lead balloon. It's quite sad, actually, <laughs> because it's such a fascinating text. But. Thank you, then. Thank you, Bradley. And very, very interesting.